You're listening to This Week in America with Rick Bratton. Welcome back, everybody. Thank you for joining us this week in America. Robert Maxim's Legacy Series has earned international acclaim as he highlights life's true virtues and purpose. A frequent guest at book fairs and conventions, as well as a go-to media resource, Robert was born in Cuba, moved to the U.S. at age 12, growing up in California. Now, as a child, he experienced sleep time visits to other worlds and alien craft encounters. Those visions continue in both wake and sleep states, shaping his life and changing his calling to science, religion, and the science of life. In 2014, Robert published the first in a series of five legacy episodes to rave reviews called A Must Read for Every Truth Seeker. Legacy is set in the future, describing one man's incredible journey through several lifetimes as far back as a million years. The blunders, the triumphs, the many worlds and places where those experiences took place that one man, Robert Maxim, and he's back with us on This Week in America. Robert, welcome back to the program. Always a pleasure, my friend. Thank you for being with us. Thank you for having me on board, Rick. We, well, you'll be here for possibly forever because we keep getting all of these questions from uh, listeners and viewers. And again, we ask you to uh, participate in the program by getting a hold of us at either of our websites, thisweekinamerica.us or rgaten, G-A-E-T-A-N.com. So much to talk about. Nobody wants to listen to me. They want to listen to you. So let's get into the questions. First one, this is, uh, this is an interesting one. How do you change the world? Oh, <laughs> yeah. Okay. Short but sweet. <laughs> well, you know, the magic formula is by changing our own lives one thought at a time, that's how we change the world. It starts with us never converting, accusing, or demanding other people or uh, to change their ways or their desires. It must be us that, that changes. Uh, we're too used to trying to convert people because supposedly God said so. Not the case. He never did. If we look at Matthew 28, 20, Jesus says uh, to live and teach his two commandments, not to convert. That the world must want to learn and practice infinite loss. And we can't force people to do that, not even to save the world from nuclear chaos, because then we're really getting involved to save our own life, aren't we? And, and that's no longer about the lives of others, it's about our own life. So the world must be what it must be for what others need for their own purpose. Not just because we don't agree with it, we're going to go change it. That's that's not universal law. So we're here to change ourselves and then maybe get out of Dodge if we succeed. Well, that's interesting. And you mentioned that uh, we're not here to convert. And so often people who have a point of view feel, and a religious point of view especially, feel their mission is to convert other people. And you're basically saying if we do things properly ourselves, other people will follow, uh, and we don't have to do it in o an overt fashion. Yeah, look at look at Jesus' own life. Jesus never tried to convert anyone by his own way of being and by what he said. He changed the world. Um, others fell in love with his ways, with his teachings, and they wanted to be as he was. So... Uh, and he said, basically, that the Father does all things. So let's work for that Christ consciousness, and let's make sure we have it. Let's make sure that others, when they are around us, can feel that love and that, that goodness, that selflessness that Jesus expressed. That changes everything around us. But first, we have to change. We have to be that change agent within ourselves. Otherwise, what people are going to pick up from us is not going to be a Christ consciousness. It's going to be a consciousness to stay away from. Interesting. It all starts with the person that you're looking at in the mirror every, every right. morning. Good answer. Uh, another question uh, from a listener. I heard you mention that you worked in aviation. It is also stated that you have a science background. 
please tell us about yourself. I think that will offer some context uh, and add some credibility when you speak. And that's interesting because we get uh, started right away in the program and talking about all the, uh, the, the questions that we've had come in and really have not focused on exactly who you are and the broad background that you've had. Uh, mm -hmm. Talk about that, the, the aviation part of it, the, the science part of that, uh, the foundation that you have that makes you who you are uh, today, Robert Maxim. Well, originally a concert pianist, I turned to mathematics uh, and physics uh, after my experiences because I had to understand uh, that developed into cosmology, theology, electronics, computer science, education. Um, I studied at Cal State and then ASU and Western International University where I graduated summa cum laude in computing and education. And I've been certified in a variety of business and industrial scientific practices. Uh, I carried out originally laser optical research uh, and went on to design and developed uh, military avionic and electronic artifacts that today are used to protect the United States Navy fleet and also helps aircraft take off and land and cruise at high altitudes. So next time you get on an aircraft, most likely you're flying on some of my controls. <laughs> Interesting. Now, uh, see, I, as often <laughs> as we've talked, and it's been well over three years of pretty much monthly programs, I didn't know that. What, a, what an impressive scientific <laughs> background. And it's obvious that you look at things from the perspective of a scientist and someone with an open mind. Well, I also helped uh, <clears throat> put together the first Marsh... Martian 3D visual at the Jet Propulsion Laboratory where I was an intern and participant. Uh, we gathered these pictures from the Mariner mission and then I was a contributor to both the Pioneer, the Voyager, and the Galileo projects at JPL. Uh, now, I've since devoted my time to civilian activities and personal research and I continue working in the computer science field uh, where there seems to be a lot more uh, opportunity uh, for providing the time I need uh, for the research uh, I do. So when you talk about uh, aliens, life on other planets, unidentified flying objects, that type of thing, you're not basing your, your knowledge on what you've read in the National Enquirer. You're, you're basing it on what you've experienced uh, as, as part of that community. Well, not only that, at JPL I had a, shall we say, front seat to a lot of this stuff, and uh, a lot of the lunar, lunar one, lunar two craft uh, orbiter uh, pictures that came through. I got to see them. I got to work with the Sigma Seven collectors that they had at JPL. I saw the pictures. I, I got a lot of pictures, and you will see them on my website, especially for the Moon, and now Mars. Uh, those pictures will, will shock you pictures taken by NASA that show not only uh, spacecraft uh, out in space but also um, bases and these are not small these are pretty big miles in size so go have a look and the website is very simple. It's rgaten, it's r, the letter r, g-a-e-t-a-n.com. You can link on directly by going to our website, thisweekatamerica.us, and looking for the information on, on Robert. Another website that's very valuable in understanding what we're talking about in the show today is unariansunited.com. So uh, a, a real broad background there. How many years have you been involved in science? Oh, since I was 15 years old, so give away my age, it's been about 45 plus years. That uh, <laughs> and still the the mind of a young man, the inquisitive mind of a young man. That's uh, so interesting. And again, the website is rgaten.com. Uh, another question: I've stopped going uh -huh. to a church where they preach the prosperity gospel. Oh. Basically, you will be judged on the amount you give to win souls. That's the amount of money given to the church. And greed is acceptable. In fact, the pastor oh. even brags about his possessions. How does that reconcile? with your teachings? Well, 
I'll tell you what, first let me applaud the listener's courage and humility not only to walk away from a situation like that, but to actually state it. I really, you know, kudos to the listener for, for doing that. Uh, imagine that you were a parent and you use your children to go earn a living for you. How does that sound? Yeah, that's probably illegal, I, I would think, depending okay. on their age, yes. Then when somebody says, go get me some money because I need it, and you're the children, isn't that the same thing? You know, the goods, let's, here's Roberto's philosophy. Goods must go to the people, never to a leader or to buildings. That came from Jesus. I'm going to mention, I'm going to have to mention a couple of, uh, of names here. How about Ken Copeland? How about Creflo Dollar? These guys are the authors of the Jesus Jets. You're talking about these guys having their own personal jets to supposedly do missions. Tens of jets. millions of dollars worth of yes. uh, aviation there with both of those. They are legendary for the... Uh, and very upfront about, you know, I need this, so give me money. I don't know whether Dollar ever got the uh, the dollar amount he was looking for, but it yes, was like, it. it was, it was, wasn't it pushing like $100 million for the new jet he was looking for? Yes, and like every 10 years, they, they swap jets like I would swap shoes. And uh, this is precisely what this listener is talking about. And, you know, Jesus never taught about winning souls. Don't let that shock you. It never talked about that, and it never bragged. Living as, a, as humble as possible. You know, didn't he say, the Son of Man has no place to rest his head? Take a look at Mark 10, 21, where he tells the rich boy, sell everything you have, give it to the poor. He didn't say give it to the church. Give it to the poor and follow me. Well, you know what that rich boy did. <laughs> yes, yes. Uh, then, of course, Matthew twenty-eight twenty, teach my two commandments. Doesn't say to go conquer, convert, or build churches. Says, go teach my commandments. Uh, Jesus, how about Jesus' parable about Lazarus and the rich man? I mean, Jesus was all over this rich thing. Lazarus and the rich man. The rich man and the widow. How about? Uh, it's easier for a camel to go to the eye of a needle than a rich man to go to heaven. I mean, he shot down every possible article of rich imaginable. And while he traveled teaching, he did so on foot. I mean, they had multi, multi transportation. He didn't use them, he went on foot. So he did this humbly, as humble as possible. Interesting, because I will occasionally flip through the TV channels and see some of these ministers on, and I do appreciate that question and the, and the answer. I had written down before you had mentioned it, winning souls, and that's pretty much what it comes back to. I need a budget of $120 million a year to travel the world and, and win souls, and I guess that goes back to the first thing that we were talking about, the, the, the whole conversion approach that we had talked about. Jesus did not tell anybody to convert. Jesus said nothing about winning. The only thing you can do to help your brothers and sisters is to be all of the humble and all of the Christ consciousness that you can be. Act like Jesus, and then souls will be drawn to the light. You yourself, you do nothing. It's the Father in, in you that does it. So if you go on your own, to win souls, you're going to lose souls. And people, that is what Christ taught. It's not up to you. It's about the essence of fathering you that makes souls change from their negative ways to a fatherly way. That's what Jesus wants us to do. That was, a, as you said, a very courageous question and a very courageous yes. answer, I might add, as well, in explaining <laughs> that, because it's not necessarily the uh, politically correct answer that, uh, that a lot of people come up with in, in trying not to—I uh, mean, you, you laid it out there. It, it needs no clarification on my standpoint. 
another uh, <laughs> question. Does the Bible, in your interpretation, acknowledge aliens or visitors from other worlds? Mm -hmm. My pastor says a firm no. Well, as expected. I mean, do something your boss doesn't approve of and watch what happens. Uh, of course, he'll say no. But review the evidence in NASA pictures. I was just talking about that a moment ago on my website. And also on the, on the science tab, review Bible and UFOs. I describe the reasons why most belief systems need to have UFOs and reincarnation shut down. There's a reason for that. Uh, but you can't argue against NASA pictures, can you? No, no. Now, after that, it's up to you. If you want to believe the word of a man or a system, instead of hard, scientific, photographic evidence, it's your choice. Now, let's see how your pastor deals with that evidence. Oh, well, well, actually, no, I changed my mind. You know why? He's going to say, it's the devil. Now, that's... By the way, I have a write-up on that disarming strategy as well. You might want to read on it. It's like, uh, they can't argue it, it's the devil. Interesting. Interesting. Yeah. Interesting. That's at the website? Yeah. And that website is rgaten.com. A question that ties in with that is, why is there such reincarnation skepticism, especially with the biblical, which you've talked about before, and scientific evidence, which you've talked about before? Why is there that skepticism? Well, this is, I almost want to claim the fifth on this one, but <laughs> let me see how it, as politely as, and politically correct I can say this, and meaning absolutely no bias and no malice. This is all information-based. That's because that knowledge threatens belief in commercial systems. So it must be put down at all cost to keep things the way they are. It's all about control and making a buck. Uh, and if there's such a thing as reincarnation and aliens out there, well, you know what? Then this idea of uh, having to depend on a savior kind of goes bye-bye. And so do most belief systems go also bye-bye. That's why. Interesting. Robert Gayton, our, uh, our Robert Maxim, our guest on the program. The website is R Gayton. I got confused there. R G A E T A N dot com. Robert Maxim, author of the Legacy series, and all of uh, I say certainly ninety nine percent of what we talk about in the course of the program is addressed one way or another in the Legacy series. You'll find those at Amazon dot com. Another great website, by the way, UnariansUnited dot com, to get more information on what Robert is talking about. Uh, again, a reincarnation question. I must admit your passionate defense of reincarnation is convincing. I'm still trying to sort out, though, who determines your circumstances in your next life? Can you explain? Yeah, you do. You're the one that makes that, that decision. Imagine that you take an aptitude test or, say, uh, a midterm exam. And the questions that you failed are reviewed and, and they produce a, shall we say, a tutoring plan that spans several lifetimes. That plan can be extended if you, as a pupil, fail topics along the way. It's, it's you that decides by how you apply universal law, how well you learn it, love it, and apply it. What you fail today is more homework for tomorrow. If you go to my, my site again in the science tab, read Solemn Reincarnation, the Scientific Evidence. You're going to love that. Uh, I promised to provide it last time, and there it is. That should seal the deal for everybody. It's got everything. Uh, and I go into deep, 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 deep scientific concepts as to what is a spirit? What is the energy that makes a spirit? I prove it. I put mathematics down. I get down to the atomic level. I spread it through uh, Planck length, uh, quantum mechanics, everything. It's got everything. So if you want it, scientific evidence, hello, there it is. At the website, rgaten.com. And if you go to thisweekinamerica.us, you can uh, link on directly to, to Robert's website. 
The more we talk about reincarnation, the more questions we get on reincarnation. By the way, past shows, <laughs> audio and video, you'll find at our website this week at america.us. Uh, it's interesting. It's like, okay, a couple more, and then we can maybe focus on something else. But the more we talk about it, the more people, and I guess that means they're receptive, open-minded. They would like to uh, to hear more about it. This next question uh, there are so many apparent contradictions in the Bible. I'm left confused. Both sides will use certain passages to make their case for or against reincarnation, and the scripture they use confirms their belief. Both sides can't be right. Yes. It seems they choose the scripture they want to believe. For me, it's frustrating. It is. It's really frustrating, said the dear brother. It is. If not outright frightening, uh, it's just like politics, you know, which party are you going to believe in? What are they covering? <laughs> exactly, <know>? exactly. <laughs> uh, but, but as I said before, please don't go by what people say. Don't even go by what Robert Maxim say. Okay. No text. And that goes for both sides of the argument. Uh, I can't buy church founders and actually generations of the apostle mark straight generations each one to support reincarnation proving that the disciples and even jesus himself taught it the sanhedrin actually believed it too uh these are proof of heavy biblical editing that you should be aware of I'll give you a couple of examples um all these things God often works with man to bring back his soul from the pit to be enlightened with the light of living. That's Job 33. Uh, how about how about this one? All souls are subject to reincarnation. That's Zohar 2, 99 Baker. How about this? This is from St. Gregory. It is absolutely, listen, listen carefully, it is absolutely necessary that the soul be healed and purified and if it doesn't take place during its life on earth it must be accomplished in future lives now here's saint augustine did i not live in another body or somewhere else before entering my mother's womb and here's saint jerome the reincarnation or transmigration of souls was taught for a long time among early Christians. And as I mentioned before, here's Jesus and even uh, Titus chapter 3, verse 5, that used the word reincarnation, which is polygenesia. Jesus used it in Matthew 19, 28. The Hebrew letters Tav and Gimel. Jerome tells us that his translations were rejected until he fit the mold so why is there even an argument people why are these facts hidden from the public well the reason is as i mentioned before reincarnation invalidates sin sacrifice and without that salvation-based churches are shut down when jesus said i am the way for example how is that taught today jesus is the way well, didn't Jesus said that of myself I do nothing? It's the Father within that does all things? Uh, again, that's a mistranslation. The word I am does not mean Jesus is. No. It's not ego I me in Greek, which means me personally. No. It is I am that I am. Ahaya asher ahaya. God. God is the way people connect the dots and see why mistranslations are still happening they create belief systems and the belief system is business please approach with care so many powerful answers to so many actually excellent questions during the program today and if you have a question for robert you can go to robert's website rgaten.com and uh, submit the question you can do it as well at this week in america.us uh, the Legacy Series will explain a lot of what we're talking about. Uh, the, the book's available at, uh, at Amazon, of course, at, at Robert's website as well. 
uh, another question, and this is interesting to think about this. If you, what you, what if you find in your past life you were a bad person? How do you deal with that? I, somebody that's uh, going back uh -huh. and they're thinking, uh, you know, I may have done some bad things. How do you deal with that? Can you can you rectify that? Well, you know, turning yourself into the cops really won't work. Will it? <laughs> <laughs> what is the judge going to say? That, yes, it's like it's like that movie about uh, Santa Claus that uh, went before the judge and tried to prove that he was Santa Claus. Well. Kind of the same thing, but yes, uh, it's diverting here. Uh, <laughs> we we all have been at one time or another, kind of maybe not so good. So, so here's some advice that Jesus gave after asking those gathered to throw the first stone if they were sin free. Didn't he say to Mary, "Where are they that accuse you? Rise and sin no more." There you go. So don't fear. Follow Jesus' golden rule and universal laws and stick to it. Don't beat yourself because you made a mistake, because you did something bad, because that's only going to beget even more negation. And it's a way of saying, I don't care to, ch to change because I am ashamed and I refuse being wrong because I'm egotistical. Shame and ego is the only reason why we beat ourselves. Shame and ego. So hating mistakes, people, is hating God. Because it's his energy that you used to carry out these acts. So don't forget, God does not condemn. And because he does not condemn, thus he does not have to forgive either. The only person you have to forgive is yourself. And that forgiveness means don't give it to shame. Don't give it to ego. Instead, be sincere and carry out listening with sincerity what you have done that is not so well. Rise up and sin no more. These next two questions were sort of a continuation of what we've been talking about here, and I'm going to I'm going to sort of do both of these together because I think in, in, in the answer you'll the, it probably will overlap some. How does okay. reincarnation work? Which is interesting because we keep talking mm -hmm. about the concept out there. We'll sort of uh, I will ask the question to see if you can sort of break it down. And the, another question from a, a different listener: How does reincarnation occur? How was a soul passed from one being mm -hmm. to another? So I'm going to throw both of those out there and uh, okay. let you explain that for us. And I'm looking forward to your answers. <laughs> well, uh, I can give you either the scientific. Uh, I think they'll give you the scientific uh, okay. explanation for that. So imagine that you have a slinky and you perch it uh, from a ceiling. Okay, the slinky is out there. And now you put a weight on it and, and make it bop. So the weight is going to make it up and down, up and down, up and down. And the more weight you put on it, the lower it goes and the slower it goes. So that is an elastic force reaction and kind of pendulum force action as well. So death is a school break in a sense. And that reincarnation uh, subject works very much like that slinky. Um, so the more stuff you have to work out on here the longer that slinky goes down and the longer it oscillates in that in that pendulum motion if if your slinky has very little weight on it okay and you set it off it's going to go ding, 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 very fast and, and stop yes so uh that is how long your school section session will will last your higher self is the one that initiates this bopping cycle by moving consciousness toward this dimension. Now, it harmonically links, that consciousness links to compatible conception parties, parents, and causes cell regeneration to occur. During that time, consciousness resides in an adaptive state, but where there's, there's no time, as it merges with its lower counterpart realm or the lower self, okay? So when gestation ends, Consciousness is still adapting, and it does so through a child's early years. Now, upon death, 
consciousness begins to withdraw until detachment from this frequency plane is achieved. So in the same way that you come slowly to consciousness during the supposed death, you begin to abandon that consciousness slowly. And dementia is dementia, sorry, is a slow detachment process. Uh, the earth life cycle is repeated until this lower realm waits are removed and consciousness is then free to reside in higher dimensions, which purpose is in line with its evolutionary mandates. Uh, again, that soul and reincarnation scientific evidence tab, uh, it's going to be very good. It's going to show the math equations for this. Uh, now, on another subject, you should be able to recall, and I hope this answers both questions, should be able to recall the death process, the higher worlds in between lives, and your return. In many ways, I did when I was a child. Uh, so I'm sure everybody does in one way or the other. But the world retools your mind and amnesia sets in. Consciousness, people, never dies or sleeps. You choose to hide that memory and replace it with mundane thoughts. You are drawn back down here by the sheer force of your lower mental states. That slinky pulls you way down. Uh, and just as you can't hold your breath forever under water and must come up for air, so must you come back down here for air until you clear your, clear your air tank down here. So that's basically the process from your consciousness establishing that, so should we say that trip? You're going to make a trip down here. Your consciousness begins to oscillate with a compatible couple here. That gestation begins to form with your consciousness adding to it. Your lower self is coming in. You're, you're coming down into this dimension. The lower self is integrating both into the cellular level and your consciousness. And now you hit the ground running. You're down here. And don't be surprised that as your consciousness comes down, you feel the weight of negation hitting you. I felt it when I've had near-death experiences, when I come back, oh my goodness, it doesn't feel good at all. Uh, because that lower consciousness is just dragging you and beating you immediately. It says, well, I've got fresh meat down here. <laughs> I'm going to regenerate more negation. And your job is to say, no, you're not. I'm going to teach you some, some manners. <laughs> exactly. So, so that's basically the process in a nutshell. And I hope it's not too confusing, but please do go to that uh, that science tab for soul and the scientific proof, it's got everything. So much great information available at the website, rgaten, G-A-E-T-A-N dot com. Uh, listener says, I'm still confused. If we keep reappearing after death in another body, is there a heaven and hell? It seems then like life is a big loop, never ending. Yeah, it can be. And consciousness never dies, as I mentioned. So yes, it is a loop. He's right. It, only you can stop it, though, by raising your lower self upward through coaching. You learn in between lives. Now, that in between lives, that's what I call heaven. Now, hell, you can have it by what you create in life. You go where you build, but you're still coming back until you graduate. And by the way, so if you go to hell, guess what? You're still coming back. But that is uh, that hell is going to be entirely of your own mental creation. You can't go where you don't understand. And if you live the life of hell here, you're only going to carry it down there. Robert Gayton, our guest on This Week in America, information at our website, thisweekinamerica.us, and link on directly to Robert's website, Robert, author of the Legacy Series. A question, are the creatures you have encountered on your visits been in human form? Are they just like us? Do they have advanced features? How do they communicate? Do they speak English? person wants to really know who it is you've, uh, you've encountered and what it is that, you, that you've encountered. Well, I've encountered forms that are more human and beautiful than us, inside and out. Uh, I have also met beings who... Uh, shall we say, are almost f fully energy. 
you could barely barely make out a human form, but they are basically energy, beautiful, uh, radiant, glowing flames of energy. Uh, all communication has always been mental, with the exception of uh, perhaps Alpha Centauri and Mars, where it was kind of a mix of English and their own language. And interestingly enough, I understood it. Um, and now on Mars, uh, the beings were the ones that looked the most like us. Uh, uh, and Venus, they looked, and Saturn, they looked Nordic. Alpha Centauri, they were literally huge and slim. Uh, as a matter of fact, I went to try to hug one of them. They gave me permission. And I remember that my hands, uh, I raised my hands to kind of embrace them. They reached this being's shoulders. That's how tall they were. Mm. So, but completely human, beautiful, a, a very, uh, very healthy, top-notch uh, muscular performance, uh, well taken care of, uh, not, no blemishes, no defects, nothing, no illness, just uh, a pure human perfection. This question it, it, it sort of ties in with what we were talking about. I was just going to let that set in the, the, the answer to that previous question. Are the visions you talked about seeing similar to holographs? Oh, yes. Good question. Because creation is kind of like a three-dimensional screen okay. filled with pixels. And these pixels uh, flash on and off like a hologram. Each pixel is a dimensional string. So read up on string theory. It's like a dimensional string, but it's also known, in other words, as vortices or cycles. Now, both physical and spiritual planes are made from vibrating energy, oscillating, which are, again, like holograms. Anytime that energy force hits, it's a point. Robert, next question. Several years ago, I had a near-death experience. I had a heart attack and my heart stopped for several minutes. What I experienced was peaceful, pleasant, a very positive experience. Will this be what the afterlife is like? Mm. Uh, same thing happened to me. Uh, and I like, I like to call it perfect inner harmony. Uh, but for others, upon transition off the physical plane, they might refuse believe it or not, this goodness inside with the other guys, uh, the basement mafia. <laughs> okay. Uh, that is not so pleasant. Uh, don't forget, what you take with you is what you are going to get. And this pleasantness, this positiveness, is the fact that you have been detached from your lower nature. It's like a weight has been removed off of you. So that gives you some idea of what this lower self is and why you have to come back to deal with it until you clean up its act. Interesting answer. And these are really good, thoughtful questions that we're getting. And you are welcome. In fact, we encourage you to submit yours by doing so at our websites, uh, thisweekinamerica.us, and the uh, listener comments, as well as at, uh, at Robert's website, this is a good one here, too, and a follow-up to that. What actually happens when we die? What do you remember from your experiences, and are you aware during this process of what is happening? Yes. I was entirely conscious to, uh, to this experience, as I've had two at least, and felt how the body went. First, it went numb. It tingled. It didn't hurt. And then the vision, the vision just faded. Uh, into a relaxed state. Then I woke up and I was above the body feeling much relieved, calm, free of my lower self like I mentioned before, just like I had taken a spiritual shower. Interesting. It's ind indescribable freedom. Uh, and of course, the return trip was quite, it's quite the opposite. The crud was regained, the numbing went away slowly, and I got locked again into this plane. So, yes, that's how it feels and how it works. Another question ties in with that. I saw a person on television last year who was talking about a near-death experience. They said although it was a nice experience, they chose to come back because their life is worth living. Mm. Can that be true? Can you choose? 
Oh, you really don't have a choice. It's your higher self that is in control here. And see, without you are an agent of the higher self, so you're coming down, period, uh, until you solve your problems. Now, without physical experiences, you cannot progress as an advanced soul. It's, it's wise to fix your life rather than mess it up with excesses and pleasures. You must come back to finish your mission. Otherwise, if you return and insist in collecting more crud, skipping school, <laughs> and living for a physical access, guess what? You're failing your mission, and it means more work for you next time. You're here on a mission from your higher self to tame that lower self and teach it temperance, the way of life in other worlds, and in higher dimensions. Life is only worth it if you're doing your homework as you should. But if you're skipping school and re having to repeat the grade, instead of graduating when you're 18 or so, you might be graduating when you're 40, 50, or even 80. So you make your Earth experiences as long as you want to, but you can't get away from finishing school. You must finish school. Boy, the time has gone by way too quickly, as it always does, but in particular today, we've had some uh, very thoughtful questions and thoughtful answers. This really has been fun, and you can go back and uh, and watch and re-listen by going to our website, thisweekinamerica.us. We encourage your questions for our next uh, broadcast with Robert by going to his website, and I'll give you that website again. That's rgaten, R-G-A-E-T-A-N.com. Great website as well, unarianssunited.com. And, of course, you can link on directly by going to our website, thisweekinamerica.us. You can check out the Legacy Series at uh, Robert's website. You can check it out at, uh, of course, Amazon as well and get information and order from there uh, uh, also. Robert, it is always a pleasure. Time went by way too quickly. Uh, yes. I'm sure you're tired after all these answers. There was a, a lot of thought that went into those uh, those answers today, and I really appreciate the, the level of questions that we're getting from the, uh, the oh, listeners. Yes. yes, indeed. For me, it's a great pleasure to be able to share this. Um, a lot of that is, of this is not necessarily for me. It's for others to, to also learn from and lose their fear that uh, they will have a problem if they actually study. That is, is not the way of heaven. The way of heaven is to study and to progress and have no fear. Well, these programs have been very meaningful to many people, and I appreciate you taking the time to be with us on the program. Good. Once again, it's Robert Maxim, R. Gaten, G-A-E-T-A-N dot com. And uh, you can link on directly by going to our website, thisweekinamerica.us. Robert will be back with us. All the old shows available in the archive at uh, our website as well. You're listening to This Week in America online, thisweekinamerica.us. We're back. More on today's program right after these messages. <laughs> 